Hey, how's it going? I'm Dave and welcome back to my channel. That's really for me because it's been over a year since I posted a tutorial here and I'm finally getting back around to it. And what better way to do that than with one of my most requested videos so far. Um, a while back, I put up a video on how to make ornate mandalas. And inside of that video, I included a piece of artwork that I had made that integrated a mandala into, I think it was a lion, might have been a tiger, maybe both. And I received a number of comments there asking how I put that together. So finally, I'm getting around to it. This video is where I'm going to show you how to make your very own mandala, mandala animal or mandanimal, mandalimal. I'm just making up words here. All right. Here's a look at the bear that I put together for this tutorial. And actually, this is a point that I'm going to make right off the bat. I followed the same process myself twice and came up with two completely different results. It's important to note that this tutorial isn't going to be how to make this bear or how to make this bear. It's going to be how to follow the similar sort of process so that you can come up with your own piece of art that looks similar to this in style, but maybe you take a bunch of the building blocks that I show you here and apply your own spin or twist on it just to make it completely different. Anyway, all that being said, the first thing that you're gonna to need to create something like this is a piece of reference. If you are a good traditional artist, you may sketch it out on paper and scan it in. That's not something that I have the luxury of, of doing or being, so I have to turn to photographic reference. And while I would love to be able to go out and photograph a bear myself, that's not really viable either. So for that, I have to turn to the internet. And what I'll do is I'll use a site called Unsplash. There's a number of really good free photos that have been submitted by a community of photographers here. And I can use these for reference and assets throughout a number of my design and illustration projects. I'll show you folks quickly the license terms. They can be downloaded for free for commercial or non-commercial purposes, and you don't need permission. So for this, let's search for a bear. Now, the one thing I did mention was that these images are free. If you do notice an image that's labeled as Unsplash Plus, that does require a membership to access, but we can filter those out just by turning on the free option up there, and it still leaves us with a number of really, really strong images. So for this look, for this illustration, it's important to source an image that's relatively symmetrical. It doesn't need to be perfect. The, the, even the lighting, that can be off as well. We're just trying to get the basic form and shape of the animal that we're illustrating. So there's a lot of great options here right off the bat. And what I did was I went ahead and grabbed a number of these and saved them to my machine. I think this was one of the ones that I used here. So let's have a quick look at these. And you can see I was going for that symmetry there's a few images here that are a little bit off, but in the next step, we can correct that. So the next thing I did was to open the images in Photoshop, and then I just hacked them together. This isn't what the tutorial is about. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of other Photoshop tutorials that you can follow, but I just used the lasso tool and roughly cut out sections that I liked. And you'll see here when I pop open the actual um, piece that I had done, I reflected two layers. So I had the same side of the face reflected to create that symmetry. And I wasn't really happy with the way that the snout of the bear was looking with the open mouth. So I pulled the snout from this bear, which was a little bit more straight on. The perspective changed a bit and the mouth changed in the fact that it wasn't open. So I'm really just roughing it all together. And then from there, I just used a pink brush with the brush tool with a small brush set to hardness of 100%. And I very roughly kind of mocked up the shapes that I wanted to create. And then I reflected that as well, just to see how the final product looked. And this is the sketch that I saved out and will import into Illustrator in the next step. Okay, here we are back in Illustrator and we're taking a look at this bear that I put together. And I'm gonna show you all of the layers and the processes that I used to get to this point. 
If I open up my layer palette over here, you see, you'll see that I've got it broken down just into one layer for the artwork, one layer for my reference image, and one layer for my guides. So let's recreate this structure and I'll explain why I set it up this way as I go. So we'll close that for now and we're gonna create a new document. You can navigate to the menu and say File New or you can use Command N, the key command, to pull up a new document. We're creating a vector piece of art. There's not gonna be any raster elements in it. So the size doesn't matter really at this point because you can adjust your artwork later to any size without losing quality. But let's create a 20 inch by 20 inch canvas. Feel free to use your own size if you want. With a 20 inch by 20 inch canvas set up, we know that our center point is going to be at 10 inches and 10 inches. So we can create a rectangle or square, press M on the keyboard to pull that up, click once, create a 20 inch by 20 inch square, and then using the transform palette up here, we can position it to that 10 inches by 10 inches that I mentioned. If you're using a different size canvas, your center point's gonna be different. And now with this setup, it's gonna allow us to drag guides out to the center point and it will have it snap there. So let's rename this layer to guides. And then let's pull up our rulers. Command R pulls up the ruler. And then from the side over here, you can pull out a vertical guide and it will snap to your center point. And then pull out a horizontal guide and have it snap as well. All of these annotations that are popping up, that pink writing, if you hit Command U on your keyboard, that will turn on or off smart guides. I like to have them on because they'll indicate when things are intersecting. So Command U to toggle smart guides on or off. Once our guides are set up, we can delete the rectangle. You can do that by selecting it and deleting it, or you can delete it out of the layer palette out over here like this. Once I've got my guides set up on their own layer, I like to lock them here with the layer palette lock. Guides by default are generally locked. You can see the guide settings in here and under view guides, and you can lock or unlock them. I've had situations where guides are unlocked and you end up moving them around accidentally with your artwork. And since we want to focus on the symmetry of this piece, it's important that our guides don't shift. So I like to keep them separate like this with that lock that I know no matter what, even if the guides technically are unlocked within, they can't move because the layer is locked. Now let's create a new layer and this is going to be for our reference image. So for this, we're going to place the sketch that we did in Photoshop or that you sketched out on paper and scanned in yourself. Either way, it's up to you. I mean, you can even use the photograph directly without creating any kind of sketch. You can just drop a photo in here and use that. But for this um, example, I'm going to drop in the sketch that I did in Photoshop. So we're going to navigate to where it is on your computer. And I think this is it, my second take. And then through that place dialog, you have the option to scale it. I just click once and it brings it in at full size and then I can scale it down now. I'm gonna hold down the shift key to constrain it so that we don't change the ratio of it. So holding shift will transform it proportionately. And then I'm going to position it in the center of these guides. Now, my artwork was centered in Photoshop, so that's why when it snaps here, it is centered. If you've got something that is a little bit off center, just make sure that the center point of your reference is lining up with the center points of your guides. Now, let's create the layer for the artwork. And this is where we're gonna build all of our artwork on top. Let's lock our reference, and I'm gonna to explain to you why it's important to set this up as a proper reference image. So. On our artwork layer here, if we pull up our pen tool, P on the keyboard for that, and we open up our color palette, and let's turn off the fill so that we're just working with a stroke. Let's maybe increase the stroke width a bit. And let's start creating some paths here. And we wanna go into maybe outline mode at a certain point just to take a look and see how things are aligning as our strokes become more elaborate and as we start using fills, it will be important to check our artwork that way. So if you hit Command Y, it switches you into outline mode and you can get a better look at what's going on with the path if there was gaps, if there was alignment issues. 
but what you'll notice here is that our reference image disappeared. So that's because we've just set it up as a normal layer. What you need to do is double click on it and actually change it over to a template. And then you have the option of dimming it. So if you've, if you've used a sketch or a real photograph that is darker, you may want to dim it so that it's easier to see. In this case, our background is white, so we don't really need to, but we'll leave it at 50% dim. And now when you switch back and forth from outline to preview mode, your reference image will stay in the background and still be visible and usable as a, as a guide. All right. So I freehanded that section there. Obviously we want this to be a circle. So later on, we'll be using the ellipse tool L on the keyboard. We'll pull that up for you so that we can create a clean version of a circle. You'll notice what I did here was I started my circle from the center point. Normally when you select your circle tool, if you click on a point and start to drag from it, you'll create a circle that starts either to the left or the right of that point, depending on how you are dragging your mouse. So what you want to do is option click when you're using the circle tool. And then that means your starting point will be the center of where you click and where you drag from. And then if you hold shift, you'll constrain it so that it is a perfect circle and not an oval. So shift and option at the same time will create a perfect circle starting from a center point of a guide. So there's a great first piece that we've dropped down from that center guide. From here, let's use the command copy, command C on the keyboard, and then command F to paste in front. Command V would paste a copy, but it doesn't paste it back directly in the location that you copied it from. So command F paste in front is a handy tool to give you a copy directly on top of where you started. And now with these circle elements, holding down option and shift, we can draw those out to a larger size. We've scaled them up. So now we've got a couple circular elements on our canvas that are looking good. The next thing that I want to do is define the core shapes of this face. So for that, I'm going to use one of my favorite tricks in Illustrator is with the pen tool. Now you can manually try to trace out the shapes that you had created in your reference sketch. And with practice, you can get really close to what you had envisioned with your initial rough lines. However, these paths still have some variance in them and they're not entirely geometric or symmetrical looking. And you can see in all of these other cases, I've got some very precise, almost technical looking paths. So to create that look, what I'll do is I'll use the pen tool, but instead of trying to drag out handles and create smooth curves on my own, I'll hold down shift in certain cases to constrain to a straight line or 45 degree angles. And I'll rough out the basic shapes just with single clicks. So no clicking and dragging, no handles being drawn out, just straight lines at this point. Now let's find that endpoint there and I want to drop this so I can switch to another tool or I can use the deselect key command, which is command shift A to drop that path. And I can use the direct selection tool, which is this white arrow up here. Press A on your keyboard to, to select that. And then we can hold down shift and select a couple points at the same time that we want to be the same radius. And then using these corner widgets in here, we can start to apply a radius to them. And that's going to help us define a really clean, really technical looking set of paths to define the snout, the main shape of this bear. And that's looking great. That's a really good start. Now, the next thing that we need to do is to create the symmetry. We want to reflect across the center path. So the way that I do that, it's manual. I know there are some symmetry tools out there that you can use for Illustrator but I use the reflect tool. With the path selected, if you hit O on the keyboard, it pulls up the reflect tool. And now if you option click on this guide here in the middle, we're gonna reflect across that guide. 
So a reflect dialog box pops up and we want to have a vertical reflection. So vertically across that point that we defined and we can now hit the copy button. So instead of just pressing OK, the copy button reflects across and creates a copy. These two paths are still separate. There are going to be instances where you want to join them. In this case, I'm going to show you how just in case you need to. This path visually looks good, so it would still work for our purposes, but say your starting point was not at a straight line, you'll see that there's a gap that's created because they're not open. So that's a good example of why we will want to join them. So we can use the direct selection arrow and select just those two points and then command J on your keyboard creates the join that you're looking for. And you could round that off if that was what you were looking for, or we could undo it and go back to the straight join here, and that would work as well. So now we've defined a section here that becomes a good base to start to build all of our details off of. We've got our circles that would create that kind of mandala look in the middle, and I'm gonna show you how I would break these up. There's a number of techniques, so this is one of them. With the circle selected that you're looking to work on, if you press C, you're gonna activate the scissor tool, and then you can hover over this intersection and it will create a cut there. We can go to the other side and do the same thing. And then with the direct selection arrow, we can pick up just this side and press delete twice and it clears it away. So, the reason I like to have an object selected before I use the scissor tool is if you end up in a situation where a path is sitting on top of the path that you're trying to cut, you may cut the wrong one by accident. So we get to this intersection here and we've actually cut our face path instead of the circle. And that's because the circle was underneath. But you can bypass that just by having the circle selected, then using the scissor tool. And even though it's underneath, because it was an act of selection, it will be the path that you cut. And then we're going to repeat this again, delete that element, scissor tool C, cut on our intersect, and cut again. And then we can delete that, and we've got the basis of our mandala element. This is another good example, I'll, I'll bring it up now, of why we want to keep guides. So our guides, where we created these circles from, are going to show us where we would rotate around if we're going to add in other elements to add to this mandala effect. So let's create a little spike here quickly. And I can talk about how I did all of that later, but right now I'm talking about the rotation. So in other tutorials that I've shown where we're creating a mandala, these circles would remain whole. The circles would have a center point that would allow you to constantly have reference of where you would want to rotate around. In this case, because we've cut this path, that center point is now shifted up to here. That's the center of where this path fits. And if you rotate around this, you're no longer going to now apply to this circular path. But by having a guide set up where the center point of your mandala is, we can rotate around this section here. Press R on the keyboard to pull up the rotate tool, and then option click on that center point. And you're now going to be able to follow this original circular path that originated from that center point. And we can come in here with, say, 4.5 degree angle rotation and hit copy. And we get a rotation that follows that original path. This is another one of my favorite tricks. I've taught it in many of my other tutorials. It's the transform again function. So that rotation and copy is one transformation. With this path still selected, we can repeat that transformation by hitting command D, which is the keyboard command for transform again. So we can create several copies that follow that path very quickly by creating one transformation and then repeating it again with command D several times. I'm going to show you a quick selection trick here that works early on when you've got not a lot of objects. In this case, these are the only 
elements that have a, f a black fill in this illustration. The other pieces all have strokes. These are the only elements that have a fill. So what you can do to select all of these elements all at the same time is to say select same fill color. And all of these objects that were black are now selected. And what I'll do here is deselect just the middle one. Using Command G, I'll group those together. O for the reflect tool. Option click on that center point and vertically reflect across that axis. Hit copy. And now we've got ourselves the basis of our spiky mandala in the middle here. I can now hold shift with the selection tool, pick up the rest of those pieces and group them together. So if I ever need to move these or do anything with them later, they're grouped together and it just makes the file a little bit neater. Another thing that may come up for you when you're working with a bunch of paths is the desire to use the shape builder tool. So I'll show you an example of that now. Let's create a series of lines that would come up to here maybe. And then let's copy them and move them a little bit. So this is a good example. In that first set of circles that I had trimmed to this line, I used the scissor tool. And you can use the scissor tool here as well. You can also, because these are on a 45 degree line, you can just use the direct selection tool and manually position the endpoints of these paths. This can get tedious as well. I'll use this a lot. But if you're looking for the ability to get rid of these ends of a line a little bit quicker, the shape builder is something that you can use. So we'll start out with the selection tool and we'll select these three lines that we want to cut and we're going to select the line that we want to cut across. And then with the shape builder tool active, it's down here in your tool palette. If you option click, you can manually pick out each of those endpoints and it will delete them for you. Let's undo those. Or you can option click to get to the uh, subtraction mode and then draw a line across them. So that's going to be handy because there's a lot of repetition. You'll see I've got lots of sections here where I created a number of lines and then I'd end them. And instead of manually dragging each line back to a point or using the scissor tool to cut them, I would use the shape builder tool just like that to knock those out quickly. The shape builder tool can become a bit of a mess. You might wonder why I didn't use the shape builder tool when I was knocking out these circles. I'll show you that example now. So say you had a number of circles and you wanted to cut them using a line that you had somewhere else in your document. If you use the shape builder tool in the same method that I showed you, because these were full shapes, they'll knock out this way. And that looks like it's created the same result. But if you drag these shapes out now, you'll see that it actually filled in those empty gaps and kept this as a solid shape versus just a stroke. When we're up here, if you take a look at this, it maintains the integrity of just it being a stroke. It doesn't close the path. So it ends up being the result that we're looking for. Here, structurally, it may look the same, but it ends up with this extra connection, which can cause problems. So I try to avoid it in those cases with, with closed paths and try to only use it for this look with an open path like that. All right, so we've talked about rotating elements to create that radial pattern, that mandala pattern. I've also got a number of elements in here that follow straight lines, and I'll show you how I achieve that result right now. So for instance, if we wanted to create a dot, hit L on the keyboard to pull up your circle or ellipse tool, hold down Option and Shift, and create a dot, create a circle. It's got a black fill, and if we want to create a line or a pattern of them that follows a certain path inside of our design, you can option click while moving the dot and you see that the tool tip changes there from just a black arrow to a black and white arrow that indicates that you're going to drag out a copy and i do this a lot where i'll 
drag something over, create the copy, and then we can repeat that transformation again with that key command that I talked about earlier, command D for transform again, and it will repeat the same transformation, the move and the copy. And you can keep pressing it to create a pattern that looks like this. What you will notice is that I was off on my initial move, the angle, so that we've got to a point where we're now intersecting with this path down here. It got closer and closer. And that's because this wasn't on a 45 degree angle and my uh, original transformation, like I said, didn't line up with that. So one of the ways that you can achieve the same result, but with a different technique is to just drag out one copy and position it in a spot that is an even alignment here with our original line. And then with both of these dots selected, we're going to make a blend out of them instead of creating a series of copies. So we're going to say object blend make. And then we now have a path in the middle and it is filled with a series of copies of this dot. There is a number of ways to control this. So we're going to go back to object blend blend options. And we're going to change this from smooth color to specified steps. And in here, we can define how many copies we want to have along that path. So let's step down to seven, and we can update the preview here, and we can see what that looks like with seven copies. Maybe it's just a little bit too many. So let's drop it down to five and take a look at that. And I think that that looks much better. And we can hit OK. And that's, that's great. We now have a blend that has been created here instead of creating all of those copies. So it can help in a situation where you've got a large area that you want to cover, the angle is not precise, and you now have a number of copies without doing all of those other steps. There's also more control here, but one thing I'll show you first is to go Object Expand. And if you do that, it's going to release the blend and actually create the dots here for you. Originally, if you looked at this in outline mode, you would see that those dots weren't actually there. But by going Object, Expand with it selected, of course, you're going to expand the blend and end up with the actual physical dots. That is a good situation to be in if you wanted to, say, flip the fill and stroke of just alternating dots to create a pattern that looked like that. I'm going to undo that and go back to the blend. The other thing that you can do with the blend, which is interesting, is to double click into it and select just this object on this end. With this isolated, with the selection tool, you can reduce the size of the blend on this side and you'll see that it steps up and creates a smooth blend right back up to the full size dot. We can increase the size of this one if you want to exaggerate it. And that will be a cool look. And then if you hit this arrow, it will return back to your artwork. And then from here, you can do that e expansion again, and you'll get the pattern that's been created with those different size elements. All right, there's a number of shapes in here that I've created just with basic circles, squares, and with the pen tool. There's going to be other elements that you can create, shapes, that are slightly modified versions of the core, core shapes inside of Illustrator. So with a circle, we can create this kind of petal shape that's seen here on the nose. So let's go into the middle, hold down Option and Shift, and create just a basic circle. Let's use the eyedropper on the keyboard to pull that up to match our stroke, or to change the fill to a stroke and the stroke width. And then let's modify this circle to create this sort of petal look. Let's do that by selecting just this point up here. And we'll start out by deleting that, leaving us with just half the circle. And then let's use the pen tool. P on the keyboard pulls that up. And let's option click on this point. And it removes the handle so that it converts it back into a sharp corner. But with the circle starting out the way that it did, you end up with just these curved handles here, which we can adjust manually if you want and bring them down here to that guide. And that creates a really cool shape that started out as a circle and has turned into this petal. 
That's another quick key command that I'll show you now. We've got this petal shape here and it is an outline. I had used the eyedropper to select that outline to change it from fill to stroke. And you can do the same. You can also invert your fill and stroke in the color palette by clicking up here, or you can hit Shift X to achieve the same result. And that flips the fill, the active fill and stroke color. And when you've only got one active and the other empty, it just changes back and forth between fill and stroke elements. I like to use the eyedropper to maintain consistency throughout this piece. You'll see that there are several stroke widths that are used but I like to limit it to three, four at tops so that everything, all of the lines that are linking together end up being consistent. If you had 10 or 12 different stroke widths inside of here, it would look a little bit more chaotic, not as uniform. So that pretty much does it. It's, an, it's a series of simple illustrator functions repeated over and over and over again to end up going from something like this to something like this. In total, a piece like this would take me four to five hours. I may not do that all at once. Sometimes it does get tedious, so it's good to start a project and then come back to it later. One thing that I will note is that it's important to also be able to take a step back and undo sections that you weren't happy with. When I was building this bear originally, I was not happy with the way the ears looked. So I had had them in and had several elements and it's important to be able to grab a section and delete it and start over again. If you get too locked in with an element that you're not happy with, you're not going to fix it by completing the rest of the piece. So it's important to be able to take that step back. When you get to the end of your project and you've built all of the details that you want to build and you're switching back and forth from outline to preview mode, you will notice that there's a lot of areas where the strokes are overlapping and covering themselves and they look fine in preview mode, but then in outline mode, things can look a little bit messy. If you want to clean that up at the end of your project, I recommend making a copy of your artwork naming it as such, call it final vector version, making sure that you turn off the original working layer. It's important to keep these things just in case you need to come back and adjust it because this is a destructive process. And then with this layer active, you can hit command A on your keyboard to open everything up. And then you can go object path outline stroke and that creates outlines of all of your paths that had been stroked. And then from here, you one last step, you'll just wanna verify that all of your fill colors are the same. That indicates that you don't have anything overlapping. Say you had a shape in here that was white and you were using that to knock out some of the black instead of actually cutting the path in the first place, it'll create a bit of a mess. But in this case, everything is clean. It's all the same fill color. We can drop into our Pathfinder and use the Unite feature, and that will just create one clean final version. Everything has been merged together. All of those overlapping paths and strokes have been cleaned up, and you end up with this really nice looking vector piece. I'm sure it would be suitable for laser cutting or engraving. It's good to send out to a screen printer if you want to have it printed. But the artwork now is, at this point, final art. So that's it. Thanks for checking out this tutorial. I had a lot of fun putting it together, just like I have a lot of fun putting together all of these illustrations with this really detailed look and process. I hope that you find a lot of useful nuggets of information inside of this video and are able to apply it to your own workflow. I have a long list of tutorials that I need to make from viewer requests to ideas that I've had over the past year, and I'm really excited to put them out there for you folks. Um, if there's any other ideas that you want help with, let me know down in the comments. If there's anything in this video that's not super clear, let me know down in the comments. And if you're excited to see what I've got in store for the future, give the video a thumbs up to let me know I'm on the right track and subscribe to the channel. You know, all those things that YouTubers ask you to do. Anyway, thanks for checking this one out, and thanks for sticking around to this point. 
I'm going to stop talking and let you get back to your day.